I'm going to do a little coding. Well, I'm going to demonstrate some code and present. So I'm not going to go full screen on the presentation, but I think that's probably big enough to see when you guys say. Oh, this is a good sized group. Do you guys mind if I take a picture? <laughs> so I actually am coming from Des Moines, Iowa. And there I run a users group, I help run a users group called Des Moines Web Geeks. And we do not just web development, or not just JavaScript, but we do all kinds of web development technologies. <coughs> and we don't usually get crowds this big, so this is fun to talk to. Uh, I run a company called Techers. I do that on my part time on the side. And that is a company that does tech training. And so I'll be doing a presentation on Node.js, a two day seminar in early June. And I'll give you details on that in a little bit, but I just wanted to toss my name out there. I mean, it's, I have a full-time job as well. I currently work at John Deere in Des Moines as I'm in the role of UX. I do user research, but I've been doing professional web development since 2001. I've started a couple businesses. I've worked at several startups. The most famous one is Canonical. We made Ubuntu, so I built the Ubuntu.com website, CMS, and ran the website for six years. Gave me a lot of experience writing high-performance web applications that site gets just a stunning amount of traffic. And so we had to build a system that could handle insane loads with no notice. And that brings me to a real problem that we have as web developers. If anyone here using Node.js? Anyone here maybe using or playing with Node.js? All right, a lot of people are, are using Node.js in, unintentionally because they're using build tools like Runt or Gulp. Um, and so it's becoming more popular and as some of the tools that we depend on use Node.js, and people say, you know what, maybe I'll build a website, or maybe I'll build a service with Node.js. And then they run into this problem. And I'm going to just point this out here on the screen. On this, we've got a four-core server, and one CPU is running at 100%. Why is that a problem? Well, if my server is busy, I want all the CPUs to be busy. I mean, three of them are taking a nap. They're slacking off, and that's no good. So when my server is busy, I want all four... CPUs going. Um, the reason why that happens on Node.js apps is because Node isn't multi-threaded. That's not technically correct, but it'll work for this purpose. And so when your site gets busy, um, you get a thousand people hitting you all at once. One of your CPU cores will go off the chart, but the others will just be sitting there doing pretty much nothing. So the way we solve this typically, has anyone had this problem yet? Anyone seen this in real life? I see a couple people nodding. So the way that we'll typically do this is we'll create multiple Node.js processes running on the same server. The, um, there's a really great tool, I'll just point this out to you. You should use this if you deploy an app to production. It is called PM2. PM2 is a great tool for deploying your apps. And you can just say, hey, start up as many processes as I have cores, and it'll, it'll just do the magic for you. Um, another solution that we'll do is we'll just use baby servers, and we'll use a bunch of them. And that's actually the way that I like to do it. I prefer that over one, C one, one big CPU, one big computer, I mean. Because if I, if I pay the money for a four core VPS and a site's idle, then I just gotta keep paying that money. But if I do a bunch of small servers, I can spin them up and shut them down when I need to. It's make way cheaper. Um, so let's say we do that, but now we've got a new problem. Um, anyone here using or playing with Socket.io? Okay, not too many people. Anyone have their computer open? Let's do this. Let's see, it is called teamdiceio.herokuapp.com. Team Can you see that in the URL? Someone wouldn't mind. Uh, it's, it's spun down, just a minute. All right, this is an app that me and my son made. He likes to play role-playing games with his friends, and so they'll use a Google Hangout, and then I, we built this app so that they can roll the dice, and it happens all in real time. So someone out there is pressing the button to roll the dice, now, there's um, five, six one-sided uh, dice <laughs> and a 12-sided dice. Now, by the way, you can, you can just roll a couple dice if you want. Um, that's possible as well. This is a 12-sided dice. And so what's happening is you're connected to this website through using a WebSocket. And so when you make a click on that button, it rolls the dice, and everybody that's got the website open sees the changes instantly. And it's, it's just a really fabulously interesting technology. Ooh, yeah, by the way, I got console lock turned on. <laughs> um, I was right. <laughs> um, it, it's fun to play with. Now, I'm going to make a prediction that 
pretty soon all of our apps are going to use this. Now, AngularJS is pretty sweet when we see how fast it can detect changes and update the display. Um, I'm hearing React is doing some cool stuff. But you still have to make a connection to that server, and that means your website's either got to go talk to the server and say, hey, give me your latest data, um, or the server's got to send it. And so WebSockets allow the server to send data to your browser without asking for it. And the code for this, I'll show you in a minute, the, all the dice rolling logic is on the server, so one kid can't hack the program and tell everybody else I just rolled you know, the number that I wanted. Okay, back to the presentation now. Um, so we have a problem because WebSocket basically keeps that list of socket connections in memory. And so if we spread our application across multiple CPUs, multiple instances running on uh, different CPUs or multiple servers, then those different instances, which all have their own private memory space, have to communicate to each other, hey, um, someone just rolled a dice, you better tell all the people that you know about it. Now, we could pull the database, but that stinks. I mean, that's the problem we're trying to solve with WebSockets, right, is to not use polling. Um, or we could pool all the sockets to one server. That's actually a pretty common way of doing it. In the Python community, they have a, a, a different solution, not Socket.io, and that's a really common way to do it, is they'll run um, a server that does WebSockets, and then they'll have all the web servers do that. Well, the problem is you can outgrow that one server if your site gets busy. You know, if you've got a popular game in the App Store that uses WebSockets, you know, and you get 100,000 people on it, one server is going to melt. Um, or we could use a message queue. Now, I'm, I'm late to the message queue game. Is anyone here using message queues? Not actually that many. Okay. That's kind of an enterprise-y thing. A message queue is basically let, you know, um, one back end say, hey, you deal with this and put it in the queue, and then that, that other process pulls things off the queues and deals with them as quickly as it can. So we're going to use a message queue, and we're going to use Redis. Anyone here using Redis? Okay. A couple people in the back that hadn't raised their hand yet are using Redis. Thank you. Uh, Redis is pretty sweet. Anyone here using Memcached? Okay, I've always been using Memcached. Um, what it is is it lets you keep a hash table in memory. So um, you just have a key. It's like an array in PHP. You just add things to the, to the array. You can serialize it. You can store whatever you want in that value, but it's key value. Uh, Memcached is really great and fast. Redis, I never thought, you know, why would you use Redis? It doesn't do anything different than Memcached. It's just some new cool thing that's replacing it that already worked well. Well, Redis has PubSub support. And what that means is that it can be a message queue. I think it would be better if we just demonstrated. All right, we've got to make that bigger. Can you in the back see that? Good. People with good vision in the back. All right. So this is a very simple Node.js app. I just moved all the boring stuff to a different, different file. But otherwise, it's just this normal thing that you get if you use the um, express command to build a new site. But I've added Redis support. So I'm importing the client library right here. And I'm going to make two Redis clients. And the reason why I'm making two is because one of them is going to be a listener, a subscriber, and the other one's going to be a publisher. And when I turn one into a listener, then that's all I can do. I, can, I cannot use it for anything else once it becomes a listener. So I need two. I'm also going to turn on Socket.io. Let's show that first. It's at the bottom. All right. So what happens is, oh, let me show you this app that we're working with. Oh, I should start it first. OK, first thing you have to do is you have to start Redis. Nothing works if you don't start Redis. That's what that OK, now I'm going to start one application on port 5000. It's kind of small, but it's OK. There's nothing exciting going on there. And I'm going to start another one on 5001. Have I done anything confusing or magical to anyone? Not if you think this is just OK. OK, we've got people saying it's OK. Those of you that are nodding, trust them. Now I'm going to go to localhost 5000, and I have a, just a really boring chat app. We'll make it smaller. Alright. Boring chat app. I type in something and it shows up on the screen. But if I open another browser,
same port, I'm connected to the same server. If I type in here, you should see it below. And it does, it shows up there, okay? Now if I did not have Redis support turned on, and I had two different Node.js instances, and I was connecting to different ones, then when I type something in here, it would not show up in the other one. But I do have Redis support. <coughs> and it shows up in both of them, and it works two ways. And it doesn't matter if I'm using Firefox or Safari, but it happens in real time. Now these are connected to two completely different servers. And if you see here, this is the server running on 5001. I guess it's not boring, so I better make it bigger. And this is the one running on port 5000. All right, so what happened? The the Client-side JavaScript <coughs> sent a message to the server, an event that was called chat message. And so on the server, we're listening for events called chat message. And when it happens, I am going to publish that message to Redis. Okay, so remember up here, client is one of our Redis connections. That's all that happens. Socket IO, whenever I receive a chat message event, shove that message onto the queue called chat. So then I have to have an event listener for Redis. And remember I said one is going to be a listener and one is going to be a publisher. Well, this one is the publisher because I just published a message on it. So client 2 is the listener. And so in client 2, <coughs> I listen here for the chat message. And when I do that, then I use my socket IO event to send that back to the browser. Again, it's not really that interesting. It's kind of boring when you look at the code because there's just not really anything magical going on here. But when you think about how it works, imagine you've got two different servers. They could be in different countries. Really, there's no reason why they have to be running on the same computer. Um, one server, you saw the delay there. There was no noticeable delay. When I type something here in the text field, Okay, see how long it takes for it to get to the other browser? I mean, it appears to be instantaneous. Just like when we did the dice roller here. You know, you, you guys all can click on that, and it shows up on everyone's screen at almost exactly the same amount of time. And so that's the real-time web. I'm going to make a prediction here that here soon, we're going to stop polling the server. We're going to stop having Angular or whatever our apps are, go into the server and checking again and again and again. We're just going to use WebSockets for everything. Because it doesn't matter. Um, if you, anyone here an iOS developer or Android? Well, there's clients for that. You can use WebSockets in your client app. Um, I'm, I'm kind of enamored with this Asphalt 8 car racing game right now. And, you know, it lets you race other people on the internet simultaneously. So people all over the world can be racing against each other. I just, that's so amazing. And, and it's using a socket connection just like this at the back end. All right, well, that's it. That's all I have. I am going to publish this on GitHub. So if you go to... Um, github.com slash newsy2000. You'll see it on there in a moment. This dice app is already there, but um, I haven't published the chat one yet. I'll do that before I leave here today, though. And last thing, a little plug for my class. If you go to techers.com and click this link here at the top that says discounts, then you'll get notified when I'm going to be in town doing Node.js training early June. I'll be doing it at the Interface School downtown. So Shauna has given me um, graciously permission to use her space. And so if you would like to learn more about how to use Node.js, there's going to be, first day will be basic, second day will be advanced, and I'll make sure that you leave knowing how to build and deploy web apps. All right, thank you very much.